top startups, uh, from top startups lawyers as well as a founder who has raised over eighty million dollars and had a successful exit. On how to uh, on how to strategically negotiate a venture term sheet and how to generate the best outcome for you and for your team. We will feature a uh, Rami Isad. Who is co-founder and CEO at Finmark, and Herbert P. Moore, who is a um, special counsel, a counselor at Mac Carter in English, and Griffith's very own Paul Bianco, who will lead the question-answer round. We greatly appreciate your overwhelming support for this workshop. And uh, now, to give a brief overview of the workshop, I would like to invite Josh, manager of business development at Griffith. Josh, uh, over to you. Hi Anya, thank you, and uh, hey everyone, thanks for joining. Good to have you here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen uh, really quickly, um, and yeah, just a quick overview of Graphite before we get started and we dig into the, the nitty gritty. Um, and I always like to start with how I got involved with Graphite. Um, I'm a past founder. I had a very small uh, meditation company before I started at Graphite, uh, and a wellness company before that. And for both of those companies, uh, I managed all my accounting my bookkeeping, um, you know, building out a model to go raise with year end taxes. Um, and it was a huge time suck. I did not come from an accounting background and not know what I was doing. And actually with my last company, um, I would have had a much larger acquisition of the company if I just understood what was happening under the hood and my unit economics better. Um, if I just had a accounting partner and I was looking for one, um, I just never found it. Um, and, Somehow after that company, I got introduced to Paul, our CEO of Graphite, um, and the rest is history. I handed, handle all growth here. Um, and Graphite is a really cool story, but in a nutshell, the company is an accounting department as a service for early stage startups. Um, and it's a cool story in the fact that we were born out of a venture fund in New York called FFEC. Uh, it started as just a small value add service within the fund uh, and quickly grew and grew and grew and was supporting so many of the, the portfolio companies at FF that eventually in 2016, we broke off to become what is now Graphite. Um, and we support many, many startups uh, in the ecosystem all across the country. Uh, we have kind of three or four main services we offer, but in a nutshell, you know, anything your in-house accounting team would do, we can do. Um, anything from bookkeeping to AP, AR, handling your invoicing, helping you build out your model to go fundraise with, acting as your CFO, et cetera. Um, and you're given a dedicated team. Um, so usually a director level individual and then some, uh, a set of accounting associates. But what makes us very, very different than other accounting firms and other fractional accounting firms is that most other startup accounting firms are volume-based. Their teams are working with you know, 15, 20, 30 clients at a time. We are the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, your Graphite team is only working with a handful of clients at a time. It's very high touch, very bespoke, uh, more of a strategic partner to help you grow and scale than just a basic bookkeeping firm. Um, we're very, very focused on infrastructure. And uh, with most of the startups we work with, a lot of them are early on, just a couple of founders. We help them set up their base infrastructure uh, to prep and grow and, and get ready to scale. Um, and then, uh, you know, aside from the strategic help and the support, um, it tends to be uh, much more cost efficient to work with a fractional team over time uh, than hiring uh, full-time employees. Um, so yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, the reason I'm so intrigued with Graphite and I, I love working here is because I really do believe there are three main uh, points and, and, and key things for a successful startup. Obviously, number one, you have to have product market fit um, that's given. Uh, you have to have an amazing team. It's also just a need. And then three, I think the one that people miss is just like really understanding the unit economics of your business and what makes your business tick. And to do that, you really do need to understand your finances um, and what's happening under the hood. And that's where a team like Graphite comes in. Um, but yeah, all that being said, I'm really, really excited to, to get this started and turn it over to uh, Paul Bianco, who is our CEO of Graphite. Um, Paul, I will, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, good. So I thought I had a technical issue there. Thanks, Josh. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, thanks for our two panelists for joining Rami and Herb. Uh, so like Josh said, um, you know, we actually spun out of a venture fund. Uh, and the kind of the cool backstory here is that um, at the time, uh, Herb was actually our in-house counsel uh, at, at the fund. 
And Rami was co-founder and CEO of one of our portfolio companies called The Still Networks, uh, who went on to raise a fairly significant amount of capital uh, and went through a successful acquisition. Um, and so I think having the perspective of both Herb and Rami is going to be awesome for this. Um, and I also just think it's kind of cool to be able to come full circle all these years later. Uh, when, when we started planning this, I didn't really think about the fact that Rami and Herb were actually on opposite sides of the table uh, during the majority of Rami's fundraises, but actually on the same side, you know, as, uh, as kind of the later rounds went on, uh, as uh, interests, uh, of course, aligned uh, uh, between founders and early shareholders as they went to raise growth capital. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to break this into three pieces. Uh, first, Herb is going to go through and give a legal perspective. He has some slides to go through. Then I'm going to kind of do a Q&A, uh, my own questions with Rami, uh, and have him talk through kind of his perspective from going from an accelerator all the way through a Series C and an exit. And then we're going to do audience Q&A. You should have an option here to, to ask questions uh, through uh, through Zoom. Uh, so please do so. Just know that we're going to do it at the very end, uh, but feel free to ask the questions whenever and we'll, you know, we'll kind of go in at the end and, and take a look. Um, really what we want to cover broadly here is two things. One is dilution considerations, of course, right? That's that's kind of the, uh, that, that's, that's a big piece of it, but also con, uh, kind of control considerations. And these are the two things I see companies tripped up on the most um, I've never seen a founder who is pleasantly surprised uh, when they do a pro forma cap table, but how much they they end up with. Uh, it's usually like it's usually the opposite. Um, and then really just the other side on the control side, you know, there's a big, big difference uh, between when you first start something, the company's fully yours, either you or you and your co-founders. And then when you take on outside capital, the dynamic does change. Uh, and there's control pieces to that, that that should be discussed. Part of it is around kind of, um, you know, board composition, um, voting rights uh, and things like that. So we're gonna touch on those matters as well. Um, yeah, and that, and without further ado, I, I do wanna introduce Herb. Uh, so again, Herb is special counsel at McCarter in English uh, where he focuses on advising both VCs and tech founders uh, through fundraises, M&A transactions, um, securities law governance matters, I've personally worked with Herb on at least a hundred transactions. We actually were desk next door neighbors. We sat next to each other for years um, back in the day, probably from 2013 to 16 or something, something like that. Uh, and we got to work to, uh, very closely together uh, on a number of things. So Herb's a great, uh, fantastic lawyer, great to work with. Uh, and we're also, for anyone who's looking for an attorney, we're gonna of course share Herb's details after this. So with that, Herb, I'm gonna, kind of pass it over to you, do your thing, uh, and uh, we'll take it from there. Well, good morning, everyone. It appears that my audio is working, but <laughs> I think the host has to uh, allow my video to start. I'm getting a note that you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Well, Herb, can you share your screen in the meanwhile? Sure. And then we'll work on the video matter. There. Okay. All right. So can Your everyone screen. see me now? Yeah, everything, everything's good. Go ahead. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Just gonna start from the beginning here. So, Paul, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I loved your I loved your point about the fact that this does feel like we've we've kind of come full circle in that you know you and I had the pleasure of working together, uh, and as you mentioned, our desks side by side at uh, at favorite, Venture yeah. Capital. <laughs> and uh, and I will just add that you know Rami being the founder of one of uh, the venture capital firms uh, portfolio companies. It's, it's great to, to share the panel with him as well. And I will say from the outset that at the time that we worked at this venture capital firm, there were over 20 people working at the VC firm. And of those 20 people, everyone unanimously liked Rami and he was very well liked and very, very well respected. So really it, it's a real pleasure and it's an honor to be here uh, with everyone today. 
So as Paul mentioned, um, I'm going to try and lay the foundation here for our discussion this morning and really cover some of the key terms and concepts that are used in early stage venture capital transactions. Um, so with that, I'll kind of just get things started by, by mentioning there's really, there's really three primary means of raising early stage capital. And you know, there are other means as well, but the three primary means are convertible notes, safes, also known as, known as simple agreements for future equity, and of course, preferred stock financing transactions. Uh, those would be you know, your typical price equity rounds that venture capital investors uh, usually lead. So I'll, co I'll cover convertible notes and safes briefly, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on the price equity rounds. So for convertible notes, a convertible note is it's essentially a loan that's intended to convert into stock. A convertible note is technically debt. Um, one of the nice things about a convertible note financing to provide seed capital for an early stage company is it doesn't force agreement on valuation. It doesn't force the founders of the company and the investors to, to really come to a meeting of the minds as to exactly what the company is worth when that can be difficult at an early stage. Um, so it really it defers the question of valuation until a later equity financing. Another advantage of a convertible, convertible note financing is it's often faster to close than a priced equity round. Um, you know, as we'll go into in more detail, a priced equity round involves many different legal documents. Um, so for a convertible note financing, you have less documents, which means quicker to close, lower transaction costs. Generally speaking, deal sizes vary with convertible note financings, but for an early stage, essentially seed capital financing transaction, usually those deals are under a million dollars. You know, we've seen that number creep up a bit in, in recent years in our practice. Um, but generally you're, you're dealing with financing rounds under a million dollars when you're talking about a convertible note financing. And convertible note financings, they're really looking toward the future. They're looking towards the next round of financing. And the investors who are participating or, or leading the convertible note financing, they're really, they're looking to be compensated for the early risks that they're taking by converting that note, so that debt into stock when the company does a priced equity round. Some of the negotiation points that you'll deal with in a convertible note financing are interest rate on the note, maturity, so how long the company has before the note matures, the conversion rate, and as, as you'll see in my slide, I mentioned discount cap conversion price. So you know what that what that essentially means is the note when it converts in that priced equity round, the investors actually get a discount on the price of the equity that their note is converting into. And you know as I mentioned, I mean that's to compensate them for. The, the risk that they're taking by investing at an early stage. And so the notes uh, generally convert automatically upon certain events, such as a, a priced equity round, a term that you may hear in, in the world of convertible note financings is a qualified financing. So usually the terms of a convertible note require that the company raise a certain amount of capital in a priced equity round before the note automatically converts. It's worth mentioning that convertible notes really come in a, a, a wide variety of uh, shapes and sizes. There's really not a, a generally accepted standardized template for convertible notes. Um, so, you know, you do get, you get a variety, you know, and they can become relatively complex, particularly if you have an investor that wants a board seat or protective provisions or information rights. So they can get complex pretty quick. And as a result, um, more recently, the simple agreement for future equity has really become, has become more popular in recent years. The SAFE uh, really came about around 2013 and became popularized by the startup accelerator Y Combinator based in Silicon Valley. 
And the safe, the idea behind the safe was to, to really present a, an instrument that would allow early stage companies to raise capital quickly and using relatively simple legal documents. And the safe has become increasingly popular in recent years. Um, the safe is, it's very similar to a convertible note, except from a, from a founder's perspective, it has a few advantages in that there's no maturity date on the safe. Essentially the safe just converts upon a future event and it can remain outstanding indefinitely. So there's no maturity date, um, which founders like, a lot of investors don't like that. Um, there's no interest. So a safe does not accrue interest, which, you know, to point to Paul's point earlier, you know, that, that does make it a more founder friendly instrument in that you don't have interest accruing, which eventually upon conversion would lead to more dilution for founders. Um, so safe is, it's substantially similar to a convertible note, converts on similar terms uh, and similar mechanics as a convertible note. But the idea is it's a, the idea is, as the name suggests, it's supposed to be a bit simpler. Um, so, but the most, you know, uh, the most prevalent uh, for a venture capital financing transaction would be a price equity round, uh, particularly for a series seed or for a series A financing transaction. Um, that would be a price equity round. That would be the type of qualified financing that your notes or your safes would convert into. And generally the start of a priced equity financing starts with the negotiation of a term sheet, which we're here to discuss. Um, so the term sheet, it's important to keep in mind, it's not a commitment to invest. It's conditioned upon satisfactory completion of due diligence, as well as the negotiation of, of the definitive documents that I'll get into a little bit more. So when negotiating a term sheet, uh, I loved how Paul mentioned earlier, two of the real key factors that you really have to keep in mind when negotiating a term sheet are economics and control. Uh, the economics, I mean, that's going to affect founder dilution. That's going to affect the outcome for your investors. Control, those are going to be actions that either the company cannot take or affirmatively has to take. Uh, and to point, Paul's point earlier, once you take outside capital from investors, oftentimes investors will seek, uh, they'll seek control provisions such as board, uh, board seat, as well as other uh, protective type provisions. One of the key economic terms that is negotiated in a term sheet is pre-money valuation. So pre-money valuation is that's what your investor is going to value your company at before putting money in. So an investor's initial valuation of an early stage company, is generally not based on a company's current revenue, probably not even on a company's revenue projections. Uh, it's really a reflection of the potential size of the opportunity, as well as the experience of the founders and, uh, and the quality of the team, as, as Rami can, can tell you more about. Um, as we continue our discussion. Another term that's worth understanding when heading into the negotiation of a term sheet is fully diluted capitalization. Uh, you'll hear experienced venture capitalists as well as attorneys throw this term around. It's really, it's essentially the total number of shares outstanding in your company if all securities convertible into shares, such as options, warrants, convertible notes if they were exercised. So that's your fully diluted capitalization. That gives you your full picture as to your, your ownership in the company um, to, to the founder dilution point. So post-money valuation, that's another term that you'll, you'll hear used in the negotiation of a term sheet. It's very simply, it's the pre-money valuation that you're getting from your investors plus the new money that's coming in. That's how you get to your post-money valuation. So uh, the term sheet for a priced equity round is really, it's structured around the five principal transaction documents that go into a venture capital financing. So and that's how the, the term sheet is organized. And the five principal transaction documents that go into a VC transaction, 
as I have them listed here, are a certificate of incorporation, also referred to as a charter. That's the public document that gets filed with the state, so that's accessible. The charter includes both economic and control provisions. The next of the five documents is your stock purchase agreement. I personally have always found the stock purchase agreement to be kind of the most intuitive document of the five primary financing documents. It really, it sets out the basic terms for the purchase and sale of the stock, price, closing date, representations and warranties by both the company and the investors, as well as conditions that have to be met in order to close the transaction. The next document would be the investor's rights agreement, also referred to as the IRA. The IRA, as you might guess, sets forth the investor's rights after the transaction closes. Some of those important rights that are dealt with are information rights. Now that, that kind of touches on the control aspect where once, once you raise capital from an outside investor, they typically have fiduciary responsibilities to their investors to report back on portfolio company performance. So information rights, that gives your investors the right to certain, generally financial information with respect to the company. That's where a company like Graphite Financial comes into play. Once you close your venture capital financing and you actually have real serious reporting obligations to provide quarterly financial statements, financial projections, budgets, you definitely want to be working with, with experienced financial professionals so you can produce professional uh, accurate, accurate reports for your investors. The investor's rights agreement also deals with an investor's pro rata participation rights. That's a term many people use fairly frequently. Pro rata essentially just gives your, your investors an opportunity to put money in, put additional money to work in your company as the company raises additional rounds of capital. Uh, the final two of the five primary Financing transaction documents are the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement, also referred to as a ROFR. Essentially, the ROFR makes it difficult for founders to, to sell stock in the company. The, the idea is to, the idea behind the agreement is to align everyone's interests in that everyone is committed to the company and they're not going to be selling their shares unless certain requirements are met. And the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement spells out those requirements. Also, voting agreement. Another very important agreement, which deals with a lot of the control provisions that we've talked a little bit about so far and we'll talk more about. The voting agreement, it sets out the agreement among the founders and the investors on how they'll vote for members of the board. Very important. Oftentimes, investors, if they have a right to a board seat, that's spelled out in the voting agreement. Uh, also, there are key provisions in the voting agreement that deal with what happens upon a sale of a company. So just going back to the charter, some of the important economic terms, and I'll just touch on these, these briefly um, to keep things moving along here. But uh, liquidation preference, one of the most important economic preferences that preferred stock investors are looking for. Essentially, what the liquidation preference gives is it gives investors the right, essentially, to get paid uh, in the event of a liquidation, dissolution, or winding up before other shareholders. So the, if you're a preferred stockholder with a liquidation preference, you're essentially standing in front of the common shareholders, including you as a founder. Um, a very common liquidation preference is essentially the comp we often see a 1x liquidation preference. And that's been, been market for a long time now, where the investors have the right to get paid the greater of 1x or one times the original price that they've paid or the amount that they would receive if they convert their preferred stock to common stock. Um, so those are non-participating preferred terms, and that's your, your liquidation preference. Very important economic term that investors look for. And it's important as a founder to understand the liquidation preference. If you have an investor that's coming in seeking a 
a liquidation pre preference above a 1x might be a red flag, might be a, a warning um, that maybe it's not the best fit. So that's something to you know discuss with your finance professionals, discuss with your legal counsel, and get a sense as to what you know what's currently market. Control terms. I'll just touch on some of these. So again, the control terms. These are often spelled out in the company's charter, and these are these are typically a list of actions that the company can't take without the approval from a certain percentage of their investors, such as selling the company, uh, merging the company, amending the charter, uh, creating new classes of stock, or sometimes you'll even see protective provisions that prevent the company from issuing certain types of debt or certain amounts of debt. So to Paul's point earlier, with outside capital come certain trade-offs and those trade-offs can be you know, having to get your investors consent before taking certain company actions that, you know, may be in the company's best interest. Uh, the charter also covers anti-dilution and that's essentially price protection for your investors. So your investors want to know that if they're paying uh, X price per share, that the company isn't going to go out and sell additional, secured, additional securities, additional shares, at a lower price per share in the next financing. In the event that that happens, there's often a weighted average anti-dilution formula where the investor receives some price protection. Stock purchase agreement, as I mentioned, that's a very intuitive document, I think, sets forth representations and warranties. It's worth mentioning here. These are things where you know, your investors are gonna do due diligence on your company. They're going to want to make sure the company is in good standing, that uh, all the shares that have been issued are validly issued. The company has all the rights to its IP that it's using. There's no outstanding litigation. Um, a lot of these items will come up during the investor's due diligence of the company. So it's important to, you know, to have the company's house in order from a corporate governance perspective when it comes time to you know, being able to make these representations and warranties. Uh, also mentioned here, it's very important from a, a U.S. securities law perspective that the company is raising capital from accredited investors. And this is a, a defined term uh, under Regulation D. And essentially what these requirements, uh, these requirements are to make sure that your investors can bear the financial risk of investing in an early stage company where the securities are, are illiquid, highly illiquid and, and risky. Uh, as I mentioned, investors' rights agreement, that's gonna set forth information rights for your investors. Uh, not, only, not all investors are gonna get those information rights. You can set a threshold, which is also often referred to as major investor status. Uh, and major investors oftentimes get more preferential rights than, than some smaller investors that don't qualify for that status. And the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. Part of this, part of the idea behind the, the ROFR is also to ensure that your investors have a sense as to who's on the cap table. Um, and they want to understand that you know, the founders that they're investing in now aren't necessarily going to sell their shares to, to someone else that they may not be fully aligned with. Uh, voting agreement, I think we covered this earlier. Uh, this is really where a lot of those control provisions come into play, particularly composition of your board of directors. A couple post-closing considerations I'll just mention quickly. Uh, important to keep corporate governance in mind before issuing things like stock options or entering into material agreements. Want to make sure you have your board well organized, have your board approve those actions before actually undertaking those actions. Um, keeping your house in order from an early and from an early stage just makes your life easier as a founder. Um, when it comes time for an investor to do due diligence on your company, you want to make sure you have your house in order. Directors and offers, officers liability insurance. This is something investors typically like the company to get once an investor designee joins the board. Something to keep in mind. Accounting procedures, vital to have a finance team in place 
that can not only track the company's revenue and expenses, but can produce accurate, efficient, and well-organized financial reports for your investors and for you as a manager and the management team uh, so you can execute your plan. So with that, um, I think I'll, uh, I'll turn, turn it over, turn it back over to Paul and to Rami so you guys can hear from, uh, from the perspective of a founder. And uh, hopefully I've, I've laid some, laid a foundation and covered some of the key terms and concepts that uh, that come up when negotiating a term sheet and and raising capital throughout various stages. Awesome, Herb. Thanks a lot. That was awesome. And and it's funny while while you were doing that, I had an individual reach out to me said that this is all very complicated. It makes me not want to raise VC. I'm nervous. Right, <laughs> but you know what? I think what people have to realize is there are trade offs. Of course, at the end of the day, when you're raising VC capital, one, it's much lower personal risk right? You're not putting all your life savings on the line and you could actually, you know, you could start a company and start actually paying yourself a salary, right? And, and uh, usually starts lower, but can get to a decent, um, you know, a, a level, you know, at, le at least livable levels. It can go up from there. And the other pieces, of course, are getting diluted. Um, and, uh, but the goal, of course, is to uh, have a, you know, a smaller piece, of course, but of a much, hopefully much bigger pie. Uh, and so, though, you know, that's kind of the at the end of the day, what it's all about. Um, so, Herb, thanks. Thanks again. Stay on. We're going to do Q&A. Um, and um, yeah, so next up. Oh, I, OK, Rami's already on video. Perfect. So next up, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rami Assad. Uh, so I've known Rami similar to Herb for the better part of a decade now, which is insane. Um, and uh, time has just, just gone so fast. Uh, it feels like the distill story. It was like the blink of an eye, but well, maybe from my perspective, probably not from your perspective, but um, you know, so, so Rami, I actually looked back at my email because when we started Graphite, we migrated emails over uh, because we have so much in, intermingled stuff. I looked back and I found an email between us from 2013. Wow. Yeah. The financial model from Distill. And um, it's funny, you were, I think you were about 10,000 uh, MRR uh, at that point. Um, and it was really my pleasure um, just to watch Rami grow this thing from, uh, you know, from 10,000 to just millions um, in, in MRR um, and, uh, and grow to a significant number of employees, uh, raise, you know, a, a seed, which at that, at the point we met, you had just raised your seed um, to go on to raise an A, a B, uh, a C, uh, go through an exit. So that's, that's, stuff that many founders don't get to go through, right? Because there's obviously drop-offs at each stage. Um, so, so again, Rami previously founded Distill Networks. Um, Rami is now founder and CEO of a company called Finmark after he exited um, Distill. Uh, Finmark is a web-based financial modeling tool designed for startups. Uh, it's super easy to use. We use it with our clients as well. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that um, the same thing that Carta did to uh, Excel-based um, cap tables, I think, I think will also happen uh, for financial models, or at least I hope uh, will happen for financial models. It'll make everyone's lives uh, much, much easier. Uh, and we'll share information uh, about Finmark um, at the end of this as well, along with Herb's information. So Rami, just wanna jump into a couple of questions. Um, you know, on, so on my end, so again, you've been through a journey most founders don't get a chance to go through. So just at a high level, could you just walk us through the story, but around fundraising only? The story, we could sit here for hours just talking about the distill story, but particularly around fundraising, when you kind of started the company, when you raised capital first, what the company looked like at each of those stages. Um, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Distill uh, was my second go around at a company. The first company got acqui hired, wasn't a really big exit for me, didn't, didn't have a lot of success, but also didn't raise venture capital. Um, it was kind of a side hustle. Um, the, with Distill, I wanted to jump all in. So I quit my job in 2011, started working on it and started building out the product. Um, I got accepted into the Techstars Accelerator program. Um, at the end of 2011, the program started in January 2012. I had been trying to raise capital 
up until that point. Um, and it being accepted into the Techstars Accelerator program convinced a couple of angels that I was courting to go ahead and invest. And we were able to raise $300,000 along with $100,000 that Techstars gave us. That gave me enough capital, enough money to pay my co-founders. My co-founders were um, doing this moonlighting part-time and they were like, hey, we love you, but you're crazy. We're not going to quit our jobs um, to, to go on this journey, not until you can pay us. So Techstars 2012 um, in January, $300,000. That got us in the door to pay ourselves a minimal salary and get going. Um, now, we had some hurdles that year, including a lawsuit from our previous employer, which we won't get into, um, but that, that hindered us. It really made it hard for us to, uh, to fundraise. And, and I actually had gotten over 100 no's from investors until um, FFVC said yes uh, in November of 2012. We closed that round um, in December of 2012, a $1.3 million seed round. We had to close it um, literally the week of Christmas because we were so broke, we couldn't even keep the lights on anymore. We could not even keep the servers up and running um, past December. And we told FFVC that. We said, listen, um, you, glad you guys are in, but we got we to gotta move this quickly. So people like Herb and our lawyers worked over Christmas to get the round done. Um, now, 2013, um, November 2013, we raised the bridge round. Things were going well for us. And I'll talk about why that bridge round was so important. We, re we realized, hey, like, let's put more money on. The, let's put more money into the company um, before raising an A. Things are going well, but we could raise a much bigger A if we just keep going heads down. And that's what we did internally. We raised a $1.5 million bridge round. Then in May 2014, um, 18 months after our seed round, we raised a $10 million Series A led by Foundry. Um, you got probably heard of Brad Feld. He's, he's one of the, the most famous um, venture capitalists out there. Then a year later, uh, we Bessemer, um, David Cowan, uh, again, another really um, prestigious investor, preempted our Series B with a $20 million check. And then uh, two years later, we raised the $20 million Series C. And then 20, uh, two years after that, we sold the company for over $100 million. Um, so it was a, a really interesting journey along the way as the company got bigger and bigger, um, but had a lot of experience in every type of financing along the way. That, that's awesome. And Rami, so you, it sounds like, it, it, did, did fundraising get easier or harder as you got further along and the checks were bigger? So for us, it got easier because the narrative got better. Uh, now, I will say the Series C was, a, you know, uh, maybe a little bit more difficult than the Series B because things had started getting a little harder um, for us as a business. Um, we stopped. Uh, we weren't flying off the handles like, like we were the years prior to that. Um, but, but over time, um, we really, you know, we're hitting our stride. And so it got easier and easier. You know, our, our Series A, we had competing term sheets. Um, our Series B, we didn't even go out to market. Somebody preempted it. So it did, it did absolutely get easier, but that, that is correlated 100% with success, not with the, the, the rounds um, themselves. Oh, of course, of course. So with that, all right, so you've raised up several rounds, quite a bit of capital and a new company too, right? So tell me, uh, so tell me a little bit about things that you learned along the way that you wouldn't want in a future term sheet uh, like what were some of the gotchas, right? When you, you, you worked with really sophisticated, well-known investors and I'm sure you've seen pretty much everything, right? So what are the things that you kind of maybe wish you, you know, push back a little bit more on, you negotiate a little bit harder for yourself and, and perhaps your team uh, and what would, and what's kind of like, and what are the musts that you want to see now uh, and what wouldn't you do again? Yeah. Um, so th there's all sorts of weird gotchas. I think the trickiest gotcha that I've seen um, was in a convertible note. Um, th and th this could happen in price rounds too, where um, there is interest included in the, the terms. Um, interest is pretty common in convertible notes, as Herb mentioned. They're not so common in safes. Um, the tricky part about this convertible note was that um, the interest at the choice of the investor could either convert into dollars or convert into equity based on the last round's valuation. Um, so what this means is over time, the investor gets more, more ownership in the company 
at a locked in valuation. And that was a, a little tricky. I mean, that, that the, the interest rate was 8%. So that meant that the, in, the investor's initial investment could grow into the company. Their, their ownership of the company grew 8% every year, even as we were succeeding and growing. That, that was nuts. My, my lawyer caught that. I didn't catch that. Our lawyer caught that and we negotiated that out. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other little gotchas that I, I look for. Um, you know, Herb really touched on liquidation preferences. Anything beyond 1x non-participating preferred at this point should be a red flag. I, I completely agree. And then the other one that I think is um, interesting is looking at the control provisions around who you can hire, what you can spend, just know, understand them and be able to have a dialogue and have comfort around them. Um, some people don't realize that there's, you know, uh, a clause in there that says, hey, you can't spend more than $50,000 at once. Well, that, that sounds all nice and good when you're thinking about it. You're like, I'm not going to go spend $50,000 on any one thing. But that also means contracts. That means you can't sign an office lease. That means you may not even be able to hire, depending on how it's worded, you may not be able to hire the people that you want to hire without um, investor approval. So just understanding those, those terms and having a conversation around what they actually mean is, is really important. That, that's awesome. And so, and so it sounds like what happened to you there, right? So, so, so that's something you did come across and I, and I'd imagine you negotiated a way or out at least to the point where it's not holding the company back when you're trying to grow a business. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I pushed back and, and, you know, they, they had $50,000 a year. We pushed it up to $250,000 a year. You know, I, I understand good governance. I actually welcome good governance, right? I don't want to go spend a million dollars without anybody um, saying, Hey, what, what are you doing? But at the same time, and that, that number got bigger as the company got bigger, right? As our operating budget got bigger. Um, but, but, you know, initially I wanted to be able to have freedom to hire who I wanted to hire without having to get approvals first. Yeah. And for early stage founders on here, 50,000 seems like a significant number. You'd be surprised when you start getting, um, you know, to 20, 30, 40, 50 employees, um, you have vendor contracts. Sometimes that can easily be tens of thousands, right. Or even hundreds of thousands, depending uh, so, so really things do change from kind of that bootstrap mode to, to kind of growth mode. Um, so Rami, just on instruments. So Herb, Herb spoke to a few different instruments, um, safes, notes, uh, preferred. What is your preference early on uh, for founders as they're kind of getting off the ground? Yeah, my, my favorite instrument is a safe, right? Herb alluded to it. It's, it's easy. Um, it ha you can do it yourself. You don't need a lawyer. The, the documents are pretty standardized. Um, you know, there's, there's no um, interest, there's no maturity period, there is um, one key thing that, that I, I, I didn't hear that I think is, is one of the most powerful things about safe is that you don't have to coordinate a close because there's no interest. Um, it is very easy to do rolling closes with safes, meaning that somebody says, yes, I'm in for $50,000. You say, great. Let me fill out the form. You fill out a two-page form that's the safe. You send it over. They sign it and wire you the money. And then you move on to the next investor. With convertible notes or price rounds, what you have to do is get everybody, all the cats herded all at once to one's close date. And then inevitably, you have to have a second close date because people miss the mark. They don't have money ready. They didn't sign in time. And it's just a nightmare herding cats. Whereas with safes, you, as soon as somebody says, yes, you give them the safe, you get the money in and you move on to the next one. It makes your life a lot, lot easier. That's the, a one, the one caveat about safes, I think it's really, really critical is that safes, especially the new post money safes do not compound well. So if you actually layer on safe, so you do a safe in the spring, you do a safe a year later. Um, and and the, the problem with the safes, when they eventually convert, they all convert without diluting the previous safes. They, they, so what that means is they become um, prohibitively expensive from an equity perspective if you layer them on top of each other. So the best way to do safes is to do a safe, then convert it with a price round, then safe, then convert it. You have to alternate. If you put on a safe, then uh, on top of another safe, then the previous investors don't get diluted, which is the whole point of the next round. The whole point of the next round is everybody gets diluted alongside with you including investors. Yeah, another great point, right? I, I, we see that a lot, safes on safes on safes or notes on notes on notes and because it is easier to do. Yeah, it just, but it can get really, really last time. dangerous. And, and a great point on herding cats, especially if you're raising a seed round where it may be 
you have a lead that's maybe putting in 500K, but then just like 25 angels or something like that. They're not doing this professionally. They have other jobs. It's hard to get their attention um, to, to coordinate everything all at once. So it's a, it's a great point. So, so Rami, let's just, let's talk a little bit about um, just the, the control side of the equation. Um, and so was there a point where you started to feel a little bit more like, and I said this earlier, there's a big difference between, oh, I'm starting a company, I'm my own boss. And you did that your first time around. You didn't take outside capital, right? Yeah. When you raised with Distill, you did. Was there a point where you, at what point do you start feeling, you know, when you're raising VC money, this isn't my company, right? But I, I have, you know, I have various partners in this and talk, a, maybe talk a little bit about how you manage board composition, voting rights to make sure that, you know, you, um, you and your co-founding team did, did, you know, maintain some control throughout the process. You know, really early on um, in, in our journey at Distill, we ended up with a split board, uh, meaning that there were two founder seats, two investor seats, and an independent seat. Um, and for the entire period of our Distill um, lifeline, we never filled that independent seat with a true independent. We actually had a third investor um, filling that seat. And that's a credit to the investors that we had, including FF. We trusted them enough that we said, hey, I think we're aligned. We'll, we'll give you the independent seat. Um, but as soon as that happened, that, that stopped feeling like, you know, my company, it felt more like, hey, they, they, they're, there's, there's responsibility here that there's a, um, that I could lose my job as a CEO. I could lose, um, you know, control of, of the company, but I actually, I think that's healthy. I think that's, that that's how you should run a company where you've taken outside money. So I, I don't think that that's an unhealthy balance. If, as long as you're aligned and you have the right investors, I think that's, that's perfectly fine. You know, there, for us, there was a term in our, in our um, charter that said, if you do not provide material services to the company, then you can no longer, um, you can no longer vote your shares. Um, effectively, you know, if there are two founder seats or two common seats, if you are not employed by the company, then you have no control over how, who gets placed in those, in those um, board seats. So that means that if I, if I was fired as a CEO or if I fired my co-founder, they have no say into the board makeup anymore, right? And that's a very, very common term that happens. The reason it's, it's, a, it's healthy for companies to sometimes have that is that let's say you have a disagreement with your co-founder and you have to fire them for some reason, they have to walk away from the business. You don't want them meddling with the business on an ongoing basis, right? They have material stake. They can, they can muck things up. They can make things really difficult to get things done. And you don't want to have to placate them every single time you want a big vote or you want to um, raise around or something like that. Um, so that makes things a little easier from a company perspective. However, it could be dangerous for you down the line if you're fired. And you, you, let's say you could control 50% of common, but you're fired, then you don't get to vote that anyway. And so you lose all sense of control on the company. Got it. Yeah, that, that is great point, and definitely, you know, everyone think about, uh, you know, try to think about that uh, as as you're raising. Um, so here's here's my next question, and um, again, like I said before, you know, you're we're run you run VC back companies are run differently, right? It's not just your company. Hey, if you're profitable, let me you know, take a hundred grand out of the business. You just that's not a thing you could do. And what I've seen as a result is. Um, um, especially first time founders, um, you know, maybe had, you know, a, a decent career before they started a company, but, um, you know, but uh, there tends to be a huge disconnect when a company is succeeding. Uh, I've seen cases where founders maybe personally have, I mean, maybe, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the bank, but on paper, they're worth tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions. Um, Herbs it was talking before about uh, right of first refusal and other uh, components so so founders can't uh, just go selling their shares randomly to whoever. But can you, you talk a little bit about um, secondary transactions um, uh, selling into a round? Is that something uh, you took advantage of, and you know, is that something that you felt was beneficial to you and the company uh, as well? Uh, perhaps with you not worrying about finances as much anymore. 
Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. You 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 alluded to it earlier, but uh, in saying, "Hey, you can pay yourself a salary, maybe not you know the biggest salary, right?" But uh, there's this understanding that as a founder, you're never going to get market salary out of your company. Even when you hit growth stage, um, you know, it raised $20 million. I still, I mean, I made a really good salary, but it wasn't still market rate for if we had brought in an outside CEO, right? Um, now it was a, still a really healthy six figure salary. Um, but all along the way, you had, you know, you deplete your expense account, your bank accounts, et cetera. We lived off of $50,000 a year for a long time when I was used to making six figures in my prior career. So secondary allows you to sell some of your shares um, back to the company, back to investors um, to, 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 to kind of cushion your savings account, right? Um, oftentimes the best time to do it is during a, a round of financing. And, and the way to do that is to talk through with the investors that you're um, courting in to say, hey, here, I'd like to sell some, some equity. The, 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 some, some rules of thumb, one, you want to make sure that you're selling less than 10% of the overall round, right? So if you're raising a $10 million round, you shouldn't be taking, no more than 1 million of that should be going out to you, right? Um, if you're raising a $50 million round, then maybe 5 million can go out, right? That, there's a proportionality there. And the other piece is that you want to let sell less than 10% of your own stake, right? If you're going out and saying, hey, I want to sell half of my shares, that's going to give investors some pause. That's going to scare them. And the last thing to think about, um, and that's going to be, you know, whether or not investors are willing to do this is what stage is your company, right? Is there a likelihood that your company can still go to zero, um, can still not succeed? Then if that, then you can't sell secondary yet. Nobody's going to give you secondary when the company hasn't proven itself out. So you need to have product market fit. You need to be at a growth stage where you have some meaningful revenue. Um, and at that point, investors, I think, will feel comfortable in terms of giving you, um, giving you some secondary. Great. And so, so at a seed stage, probably even an A, not happening. Probably not. Really more at the B or C levels where the company with or without you, you know, hopefully with, but it, it's, it's moving along. The company is not going to go to zero. Maybe it goes stagnant, but it's not going out of business. That's exactly so, right. And, and we've seen this happen. Anything could happen, but, but, the, but the risk is way lower. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and it comes down to just uh, aligning interests with your investors at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, that's exactly right. Talk, talk a little bit about um, negotiation of price uh, when you did a price round. And, and, and um, it's not necessarily tied to, it's kind of tied to financial performance, kind of not. It's all over the place, especially right now, it, it, the market really seems to be all over the place. Uh, he, especially, you know, with really at the A and B levels, I'm seeing a huge, uh, huge uh, disparities in, in different uh, term sheets. How did you... How did you manage that? Um, and, and, you know, getting a fair valuation where you don't think it's overboard and could potentially hurt future fundraisers. How did you, how did you manage that um, throughout the process? Yeah, I mean, there's some standard ranges for valuation that, that have been tried and true over the years, right? Your seed round, you should come in somewhere between three and $6 million in valuation. Your series A, somewhere between 10 and 25. Your series B, you know, should be, um, sh should be about, uh, you know, f five to 10 X your forward looking revenue, right. And that, and then so on and so forth. And every round subsequent to that should be really revenue driven. Um, the, the traditionally each round, you're going to sell anywhere from 15 to 25% of the company, right. Maybe up to 33% of the company. Um, if you fall outside of any of those ranges, then you're either doing something really, really well, or something's really, really off. So if you fall outside of those ranges, you know, and on a downside, Double, double click into it and figure out, you know, that might be a little low to get to break out on, on the upside of those ranges, then you have to create FOMO, you have to create demand for the, the equity that you're selling, right? And in public markets, there's, you know, open buying and selling in private markets, there's not right, it's all about who's willing to pay how much for your, your um, company so that you have to create um, demand in my seed round with distill. I had a hundred investors that told me no. FF was the only one that said yes. I had no negotiating power whatsoever. Um, but they gave us a standard term sheet. I, I literally told them, hey, we're going to run out of money in a month. And they still gave me a term sheet that was like a $4 million pre-money valuation. For Series A, we had four competing term sheets and a fifth one on the, uh, knocking on the door. It allowed me to take Foundry, who was who come, came in with the lowest term sheet, and move them up by 40% in terms of price. They still didn't match the highest one. But I literally said, listen, I have, it would be foolish for me to take 
your current offer. I have to take, you know, the, I have to get you guys closer to it. I want to work with you, but here are some other offers that, um, that are there. There's a lot of finesse in getting offers at the same time because all of these offers are exploding offers. So you have to kind of move all the investors along in a cohort through the process, through due diligence until they get to a point where they're all ready to, um, to give you an offer. Once one does, you want, the other, you want to go to the others and say, hey, I have an offer. I need you to put something in or get off the pot. And if they haven't moved far enough along in the process, then they're going to back away. The, another, another really great way to get um, more leverage in, um, in, in, in negotiating your term sheet or ne getting a good term sheet is allowing somebody the opportunity to preempt around, right? To say, listen, I'm not fundraising right now, but... In six months, I am going to go out to market and I want to raise $20 million and I want it to be kind of in this ballpark of evaluation. Here's what I'm going to accomplish. If you can do that, you might find that somebody like Bessemer did for our Series B, where they said, what if we give that to you now? And so what I'm getting is six months more value up front, de-risking that and, and taking a load off of me having to go and fundraise. So that's a, a really powerful way. I know we have to run. I'll give you one more quick one. Um, get a term sheet from your insiders and then shop that around. That's what I did with my series C. Um, your insiders oftentimes can give you a term sheet. They know the, the company. Then you can say, listen, I just want to make sure that this is good market rates. Give me three weeks to talk to others and, and then shop that around. Um, if you're upfront and honest about that, then you can, you know, anybody that you that's interested in you, you can say, hey, I'd rather just keep working with my insiders. You have to, you have to beat that price significantly for me to, you know, introduce a new, you know, a new person into the mix when we have such a good thing going. Yeah. And we recommend the same thing. I mean, what, what a lot of founders don't realize is, I mean, everything you just said, Rami begs the question, how do you actually run the company when also going through, you know, speaking to five VCs, going through diligence, negotiating, that's an enormous distraction. It is enormous distraction. Um, so Herb, why don't you hop back on uh, on video, we have a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll do do a bit of Q and A. Awesome, I'm back. So, all right. So, here's one. So, what happens if the new investors don't agree with the previous valuation? Maybe the, maybe this individual also means terms, right? If there's something in previous term sheets that new investors um, in a subsequent round don't don't like, what what happens then? Whoever Herb or Ron. I mean, my experience is, and we've we've I've done this uh, actually, is that you negotiate that out, right? Your previous investors, um, if you go to them and say, "Listen, like this is the only way we're going to be moving forward. We need this money for the company. If that's the best offer on the table, then then it becomes a negotiation. They have the previous investors have to make a choice: Do I stop, die by this and hurt the company, or do I, you know, am I willing to compromise and, and remove a previous term? Um, depending on the reasons, it, it can go back and forth, but usually renegotiating previous valuations, let's say there's a cap on a note or there's a, um, there's a, a, uh, a, a, you know, a discount in a note or a safe that gets, I think a lot, lot harder. And, and, and it, it's going to be a lot harder for, to, to get them to, to agree to something like that. I don't know what your experience is, Herb. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right on, Rami, in that, you know, it, it's a negotiation. And, you know, if the terms are embodied in a, a legally binding agreement, um, that's sometimes where the control provisions come into play also, where, you know, if your investors have a protective provision, for example, that requires the company to get, say, a majority of the preferred stockholders to approve issuance of, let's say, a, a new type of a new class of stock that has different rights, preferences, privileges, you have to go back to the, your original investors to get their consent to do that. But to your point, I mean, investors, you know, it, they've got money riding on the company. And if they're not willing to, to continue to fund the company and to put the additional capital in that the business needs, um, you know, they, they may have to seriously consider accommodating a, a new request. And I, I think that's, that's probably, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning too, that that's why it's important to really try and negotiate market terms as much as you can um, and try and avoid, you know, some crazy terms that are going to, you know, 
draw the attention of your future investors. Um, because then, it, like you said, it just, it's going to require more time, more energy to go back, get the consents you need, negotiate, try and keep people happy. Um, but on the valuation front, the one thing I will mention, if you do, you know, let's say you do a priced equity round, um, I did mention anti-dilution protection, and I went through that quickly uh, to try and keep things moving along. But that's, that's a case where if you do a price equity round at one valuation, say for your series A, and then you go out for a series B and the market is telling you like, look, you know, your valuation is, is, is not where it should be. And they don't love the, the valuation of your series A round. That's where your series A investors may, it may actually trip their anti-dilution rights where it lowers their price per share in the event that you're, you know, you have a down round. Um, One thing I'll, I'll, I'll just add to what you said, Herb, it, you know, th the importance of getting clean terms early is, is so critical because it, it actually continues to compound, right? Your, your series A investor is going to be like, well, I want those same terms that the seed investor has, right? And so it becomes harder and harder to rip it off everybody. And then they, they might introduce, you Great know, point. something, something weirder that, you know, that from their side. So they're going to be, it, it's just going to compound over time. So the, the, the alignment that you want to create is to say, listen, you're going to have to live with the repercussions of these as an investor from other future investors. This is going to be just as painful for you as it is for me down the line if we grow. So let's just clean it up and do some more market, you know, terms versus trying to get crazy now. Great points, Rami. Awesome. So guys, we're up on time. We could probably do this for another hour, but I want to be sensitive to both of your schedules. We had a couple of questions related to M&A. Maybe we do another one of these, you know, related to more M&A sort of things. Um, but um, guys, I appreciate, really appreciate it, Rami and Herb. Um, th this was an awesome, awesome session. I appreciate you guys taking the time out to do it uh, as always. And, you know, and always fun, uh, fun talking to you both. So um, Anaya, maybe I'm going to pass it back over to you to, to wrap it up. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much. I think that was a great uh, round of discussion happening there with a lot of interactions and everything. Thank you so much to each one of you. Um, thanks a lot to all our speakers for this really insightful workshop session. I hope you guys enjoyed the event and had uh, many takeaways and a lot of insightful discussion. So I would like you to, I would just like to get your attention back to the screen as we're hosting an online demo day on the May 26th with an amazing, uh, with an amazing set of startup uh, presentations. So we hope to see you all there at another event. Till then, please take care, stay safe. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone.